we have to check the social institution to think about gender equality and social inclusion for LGBT people. We are ready to propose the first civil society draft on legal gender recognition, and that is that has been uh, one of the work that Thai TJ has been working on. What? Serve people what they need. Because most of the time, we always hear that donor agenda, you know, donor uh, uh, have indicator, this is what they, this is what you have to do because it's indicator from the donor on uh, with transgender community. Most likely people are going to mention trans women, but not trans men. So um, even that trans men was excluded from, you know, HIV program. Um, and this happened across, ha happened in a lot of program that working for transgender people and HIV. Thailand is, you know, very accepting, very, uh, very friendly to LGBT people. But I, on the other hand, I think um, Thailand doesn't have any like protection or promotion of transgender rights at all. We don't have legal gender recognition here in Thailand. We have been um, advocating for same-sex marriage uh, for a really long time and it haven't been success yet. So we keep still keep advocating for that. We have the network of family who accept LGBT children. So that's what we do at, in Thailand. Because we believe that um, as the, in Thailand, Thailand is the collectivist uh, culture. Oh, we have seen so many anti-gender law, especially targeting trans people um, in the global north as well. Intersectionality is very important approach. You know, when, um, for feminists, I think it's very important to look at uh, gender and intersectional intersectionality. We recognize that as a transgender activist, we've been fighting not only for our community, but, but also from our daily life. We have to be compassion, show compassion to people do, who are different, but at the same time, show compassion to yourself. All activists that listen to this talk, take care of yourself. This work, we commit not just for a year or two, some people commit for the lifetime, right? We have a lot of people before us that work toward gender equality. They have been working in this field for a really long time. Some of them pass away without knowing that their work or that the seed that they plant, how grow is going to be. The seed that they plant, how beautiful flower they they may not see that. They ha we have a lot of people that work before us and we honor them. But at the same time, when you've been in this field, when you have been working in this field, give yourself a, comp give yourself a break when you have time. Take care of yourself. So welcome friends in this another uh, very important episode of Gender Equality Talks. As we know, 90 for 90 Global Voices series is featuring different people who have contributed significantly in shaping progress towards gender equality and human rights. And today we have a, amongst us a very special guest and she is no other than Nachali Bunya Pisomparn or uh, fondly called as Hua. Hua, welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, so friends, before we begin, as you people may be knowing about her already, but uh, let me say Hua is a trans women activist who has experience working as a project coordinator and project assistant positions on different research and advocacy projects. She has worked with organizations and groups of all sizes, from local nonprofit organizations to international organizations and networks. Her experience in founding uh, you know, successful support and advocacy groups, rather I should say powerful support and advocacy groups and lasting networks are her career achievements that prove her passion and commitment to supporting the health and human rights of transgender and other LGBT people locally and globally. This includes 
being the first transgender program supervisor of Sisters, the leading transgender organization in Thailand, being a founding member of the Foundation of Transgender Alliance for Human Rights, or what we all know and respect as TGA, Thai TGA, and being the first coordinator of the Asia Pacific Transgender Network or APTN. Besides these achievements, she has continued working on the project and the program for transgender and gender non-binary individuals. For instance, she helped coordinate the development of the Asia Pacific Transgender Health Blueprint in 2014 and 2015. She also worked as a transgender and gender non-binary health advisor at Apicha Community Health Center in New York City, where she oversaw the trans health services for trans and gender non-binary patients from July 2019 to September 2020. Currently, she works as a partnership manager at Astria Lesbian Foundation for Justice. So welcome, Hua. I know your bio and your contribution is so significant. We're really extremely honored to have you amongst us. Thank you so much. I feel very, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'll be here and talk with you today. Thank you, Hua. So we just wanted to uh, hear from you. Um, you know, our governments uh, had promised gender equality by 2030 in 2015. So it's like 90 months have passed by and another 90 is left. So, uh, uh, but are we anywhere near gender justice uh, or gender equality? Are we at the halfway point? What are your reflections? To answer your question, I think uh, we still have a lot, a lot <laughs> by far to, to, to do. I'm not um, just only mentioned that um, even now we can see that a lot of like progress on trans rights um, across you know the world, but um, the more progress we have uh, within the LGBT community and transgender community, the more backlash and resistance from anti-gender groups around the world. We have seen you know so many like um, so many uh, law that ban LGBT, we have seen so many law that ban transgender, or even the global not where we think that they have so many um, um, supportive protection and promotion of transgender rights. But then um, also we have seen so many anti-gender law, especially targeting trans people um, in the global not as well. So you have seen this crisis and I feel like there's so much of the work that we have to do. Um, um, so let me put it this way. I think uh, I think um, at this moment, I, I want to give a case of Thailand, for example. Thailand has been known as uh, a heaven for LGBT people because there's so many LGBT people here in Thailand. It's high visibility of LGBT people here in Thailand. Um, so when the outsider look at my country or look, look at Thailand, they think that Thailand is, you know, very accepting, very, uh, very friendly to LGBT people. But I, on the other hand, I think um, Thailand doesn't have any, like, protection, promotion of transgender rights at all. We don't have legal gender recognition here in Thailand. We have been um, advocating for same-sex marriage uh, for a really long time and it haven't been success yet. So we keep still keep advocating for that um, uh, within the LGBT movement and allies here in Thailand. The only thing I feel like Thailand has to do well is the HIV program because we have a very successful HIV uh, program here in Thailand where a lot of people come here and take, you know, study about the model, the HIV program model from here and to apply to the other country, especially in Asia. So that's the only things that I think that are um, there, 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 there's, 
is the progress. Why is that? The reason why SUE program is so progress is because of we have lots of funding for SUE program um, from out from outside of Thailand, Thailand from um, even within the government itself. We do have some funding, but this funding only targeting to certain key population, right? So sex worker, uh, women, uh, uh, drug user men who have sex with men, transgender, and transgender women. So a lot of time when you work on uh, with transgender community, most likely people are going to mention trans women, but not trans men. So um, even that trans men was excluded from, you know, HIV program. Um, and this happened across, ha happened in a lot of program that working for transgender people and HIV. So that's, that's also happened. You see, this is, that's so much of the work that we need to do. Um, that's part of the progress that we make, but there are so many gaps that we have to look closely. Well, thank you so much Pua, for, uh, you know, for helping us better understand. Would you like to add any more reflections uh, in context of the work which you have done with Astria Lesbian Foundation for Justice. Uh, also, it amazes me, you have worked in New York, you have worked in Thailand. It's just amazing to see the diversity. Any, any reflections? And yeah, over to you. So, so maybe I should introduce like uh, a few organizations that I've been involved with um, okay. locally and internationally. So let me talk about um, locally in Thailand first. So I have been, uh, I am the founder of the Foundation of Transgender Alliance for Human Rights, as you know. I am also a vice president of the organization as well. So when I moved back to Thailand um, in 2020, I live in America for 10 years. So after that 10 years in 2020, during the pandemics, um, I want to come back to Thailand and to stay closer to my mom because you know everything is uncertain. So I don't know what's going to happen with my family member. So I decided, okay, I live in America for 10 years and it's time for me just to come back home. And when I come back home, I got approached by lots of people to ask me for support. So um, I decided, okay, I, 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 I can help the Foundation of Transgender Alliance for Human Rights because I'm one of their founder members. So within the Thai Tanjana area for human rights, they do so many things, right? It's, so let me give you a little bit of background about the organization. Thai Foundation, uh, ta, uh, the Foundation of Tanjana for Human Rights, or I call it shortly Thai TGA. Thai TGA is the one of the only two translate organizations here in Thailand. And when I, when I say translate, what does it mean? Um, it means that or majority of the board member, the person who make a decision of financial of the organization, the head of the organization, majority of staff, majority of working group member, they are uh, transgender people. So we don't, we haven't, we don't really see that much in a lot of presses, but in Thailand, we have two transgender organization. I'm going to mention the other one later, but for Thai TGA, they're working in policy changes. So the, the policy that they have been, they've been working right now is the legal gender recognition or the gender identity law. So they, uh, they work with different partners in order to draft the law to propose to the parliament. And right now we have the civil society draft that is ready to propose to the parliament. But as you know, the politics in Thailand right now, it is still, need to figure out who going to be the prime minister from the last election that we have uh, last, uh, I think it's last May or early June. So we have a new election and the government tried to, you know, elect for the prime minister. So we are, we are, we are waiting for that result so the government can, you know, can run. So um, that's, that's the other things that I'm not going to touch on much, but you know, as the civil society, we still waiting for, for, for the government to, 
to figure out how how they can form who going to be the prime minister and if that ready we are ready to propose the first civil society draft on legal gender recognition and that is that has been uh, one of the work that Thai TJ has been working on. Another thing that Thai TJ has been working on was uh, we try to look at this framework, the feminist and well-being framework, and we try to develop because we believe that in order for us to work for community, um, our people, people that work closely with us, and people from the in, people from within organization need to feel happy and well and healthy. So we try to look at the approach, how can we build a strong community by uh, uh, integrate wellness to and healing. Because we recognize that as a transgender activist, we've been fighting not only for our community, but, but also from our daily life. So we've been, you know, experienced trauma, we've been experienced discrimination, we've been experienced stigma, all of these things as a transgender individual and as a transgender activist. So at some point, uh, a lot of people feel burned out, a lot of people feel unwell, a lot of people feel like they need someone to talk to. So how we as an organization, as the one of the transgender organization here in Thailand, we create the space where people can talk about wellness and give them a space where people can heal. So that's the things that we try to develop within the organization because as a transgender organization, we're not only responsible for working for our community, but also for our people. Our people need to be well in order for them to work for other people. And this is, Thai, uh, this is one of the work that Thai TJ has been doing. So we, Thai TJ has been, you know, doing this for, doing this work for over 10 years. So we has been established in 2009. Oh, the fun fact is in our name in Thai, we use the term Gatoy, which is a very, you know, very old term to call transgender woman here in Thailand. Some people don't even know, you know, some people don't even use that term anymore, right? But because they feel like this term is insulting uh, those uh, of those who identify as transgender women, but we still using that term because we feel like this term is the Thai, very Thai, very traditional term. What we do is that we, we want to reconstruct the meaning, the, 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 the meaning the, the, of this term to be more positive. We want to be able to use it and um, feel proud of it. So that's how we use that term in our foundation name. But the fun fact is we've been trying to register as a foundation using that name for many years. And we've been rejected because, you know, uh, for some reason they feel like this term is not appropriate. Sometimes they feel like, oh, having Thailand, you know, we, we, we want to put the word Thailand in our name, in, in the foundation name, and they feel like, oh no, you cannot put the Thailand name here. So <laughs> there's so many, so, so many like, you know, resistant uh, for us to use our original, original name. And uh, when we be up uh, and we be negotiated for many years until we can, okay, I don't want to use the term Thailand in our foundation name anymore. We take it out, but we still insist that we need that category name in the name of the foundation. And we've been uh, grant for uh, foundation registration. So that's how we become the foundation, uh, the organization that register under um, the government, right? But before that, <laughs> we've been negotiated with the government, try to use the name, change, change to different offices, just because we want to register this name uh, as our foundation name. So that's just the fun fact. Uh, about how how, uh, how we establish uh, the foundation of transgender area for human rights. So come back to the work. So I already mentioned that Thai TTA working on building the policy to protect and promote transgender rights. Thai TTA has been working on uh, wellness 
and new, provide healing space for activists and also for people in the community. Another big thing that we have been doing is we have the network of family who accept LGBT children. So that's what we do at, in Thailand. Because we believe that um, as the, in Thailand, Thailand is the collectivist uh, culture, meaning that we are very close. We have Thai people are very close to their family, you know. Um, the younger take care of the elder, the parents take care of the kid, you know, send them to university, blah, blah, blah. So do all of that things. So we expect to, read, to take care of our elder. So, and because of that, family play a very important part to share the concept of gender. Not only that, but also play a very important role to empower LGBT kids. So if we have the family as the allies, we assume that the kid that grow up in the accepting, with the accept, accepting parents, they will be strong and they will be empowered and they will, they will, uh, they will, uh, they will, they will grow up. Even within a very gender binary society, they will grow up and they will know exactly what they want to be. So that's why we try to work with the family. And one of the projects that we do is try to build a network of parents who accept their LGBT kids because these parents doesn't have any network or any space to talk among each other. Sometimes they blame themselves for raising their children and these children become LGBT, so they blame themselves. And what we do is that we try to create space where the parents can feel empowered and try to tell them that they do nothing wrong. The kid just want to be who they are. This is their authentic self. The role of the parents is how learn how to accept them. And as you know, gender language is skill. So people have to practice to understand these gender languages. As same as the, our family and parents, they don't have this skill. You know, they don't equip with this skill to communicate. So that's how this network come along because we want to provide skill at least the basic languages where they can use to talk with their children. So this is the things that the Foundation of Transgender Alliance for Human Rights doing. So that's one organization already <laughs> that I've been involved with. Um, so my role is just to give them support. You know, English language is still barrier. So what I do is try to help them with the purpose or development or something like that sometimes sometime because I live in America for a really long time. So I give them some perspective from what I did in the US, from, from what I volunteer in the US for you know over 10 years, I've been volunteering some of the organization uh, where I live in Washington DC, in New York, and also has been working with a couple of organizations in, um, in New York as well. I already mentioned Thai TJ. Um, another, another organization that I think I should mention is Sister Foundation. Sister Foundation is the first trans land organization in Thailand. So I told you there are two trans land organizations here right now in Thailand that register, that, that being registered. Let me correct myself. There's so many trans group in Thailand. Just so you know, there's you know smaller groups, you know trans masculine groups, but these two organizations are registered and also a trans land organization. So one of these is Sister Foundation. Sister working uh, in Pattaya, Thailand, which is the east coast of Thailand. So what they do was they do HIV program. Uh, for uh, trans people, especially trans women in Pattaya, in Rayong, and in some other provinces in the East Coast. So um, I really don't mention uh, of their work much because I know uh, uh, HIV program may not, uh, may look similar, you know, provides uh, testing, 
uh, connect people to care, refer people to care, or you know, give them treatment, or provide counselings, provide hormone uh, level checkup, something like that for trans people. But sister, I think the strength of sister is every the program within sister run by transgender themselves. Even and um and also they don't only work by themselves, they're working with partner and allies in their local context. And that's very important to mention here. We need more allies, we need more partner in order to work in gender equality, especially LGBT and transgender people. We, we really need more ally because what happening was when, tra when one trans person speaks, not a lot of people listen. But when, let's say when one doctor speak, a lot of people pay attention to that person. So that's why this is just, and you know, it's unfortunate to mention this, but it is true in our society right now. So that's why we have to find allies who will be able to speak up, who, who will be able to provide space for us to speak. So they may not understand the whole things about being trans people, that's okay. But you have power and you can provide space for those who understand about themselves to speak up. So that's very important. That's why the more allies, the more partner we, we, we have, the more space, the more visibility we building. So, and as sister, I feel like this is what their strength. They they're not only working with trans community, but they do working with a lot of partners, especially in, in the government uh, office, especially the Ministry of Public Health, for example, because when you work on HIV, it's inevitable that uh, you have to work with uh, people from the government, especially CDC, Ministry of Public Health, uh, so on and so forth. So, and that's what sister do best. And, <clears throat> and let me, let me move to the other organization. So right now I'm working with ASTIA Lesbian Foundation for Justice. So what ASTIA do, uh, if you don't know, ASTIA is funder. So we fund a lot of LGBT groups around the world. So, so we have grant making, right, program in um, many regions, for example, North America, South America, Latin America, Africa, Asia Pacific, East Asia, Central Asia as well. So we have a grant making in the, these different regions. My role as the partnership manager, I don't do grant making. So what I do is uh, I working with the government funding. So right now I working with USAID and also the EU, um, basically to get the fund and then uh, we, as Astria, we distribute this fund to different group of people because our grantee that we work with, some of the people that we work with, working with, we working with them for a really long time because we, because at Astria, we believe that we want to support the long-term funding, not just a project, uh, for, for, that's not just for a, a short projects. So for one of the, for some of the grantees, we're working with them for over 10 years because we ex we want to give them a long-term funding, not just one year or two years, and that that finish. We we want to build a relationship as the funder uh, with our grantee. We want to see their grow, we want to be able to serve them what they need. And that very important keyword, serve people what they need. Because most of the time we always hear that donor agenda, you know, donor our uh, have indicator. This is what they, this is what you have to do because it's indicator from the donor. We often hear that term a lot, you know, especially in HIV projects. But we don't, uh, we, 
at Astia, we don't want to be that kind of learner, right? We, we, we want to respect what people need and what kind of support they really need in order for, the grant, for a grantee to grow. So we want to listen to them, what they need, and we want to be able to support what we, really, what we really need that within the local context that our grantee working on. Another thing that uh, Astia believe that I think is very important to note, the nothing for us without us principle. We believe that in order for to support LGBT groups, these LGBT groups have to lead by their own community or LGBT, especially LGBT women, transgender, and intersex. And when I mention intersex, I think it's, a, it's very important to mention Astia has, Astia is one of our very first funder that support intersex group around the world. Actually, to be honest, uh, I feel like Astia is one of a very rare funder that support intersex groups and also have dedicated dedicate a program, uh, a program called International uh, Inter, uh, Intersect Human Rights Fund to support intersect grantee. Um, so we have that program within our organization. Because, you know, as the funder, sometimes you say you're funding LGBT, but then um, if you're tracking the amounts of funding, this amount of funding may go to different, you know, uh, community, but a small amount of money go to intersex. For example, something like that happen, right? So that's why we think it's very important to have this program that dedicate to help or support uh, intersex organization. So that's how uh, at Astia we have this uh, intersex human rights fund. We also have international fund that working with different grantee around the world. We have also the US fund, which working with the grantee in North America because we are the American organization. And I feel like most of the time when we're looking in, uh, within the US, they say that it's developing country, right? It's, you know, it's upper development country. So there are not many funding going to LGBT group. But if you look at the US, you know, LGBT groups, it's very, very, they are very difficult to find the funding. So that's why we have this US uh, fund to support uh, LGBT, LBQ group and trans and intersex group in the US. So that's just a little bit of detail of what they do at Astia. But um, to point out, I think, for donor, for funder, it's very important when you support LGBT organization, you tend to support them long-term. You tend to support them what they need, not what you need, but what they need. It's very important. And in order for us, I feel like to reach to the uh, gender equality, as now, as today we talk about LG, uh, gender equality, it's very important that we have to think, we have to be creative. For us to think about strategy, how can we come together as the community and allies and part, our partner and to think strategy, how, how we can, um, how we can uh, work together to counter anti-gender group. Because to be honest, you know, anti-gender group, they have a lot of money a lot of funding, you know, from different places. And they work strategically, you know, they grant this, they don't do it themselves. Sometimes they just give money to these different groups. So these different group can uh, spread the ideology of anti-gender uh, anti ideology or binary, just reinforce binary uh, gender into within the, you know, society that they're working on or community that we're working on. They do it and they, they're very strategic about it. And how we can counter this, um, this, uh, this group, I think we have to work together. And I think we have to, at some point, I feel like, you know, local international groups and regional groups, 
we probably need space to come and talk about this seriously because as of now, from what I feel, I think it's uh, I think a lot of people do their own things and they do well. But then when it's come to threat, that bigger than, you know, that bigger that 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 is the that's very like it's that become a structure of our culture of our society we need to come together to fight for it and and i think this is some things that i think we even myself i don't know how we're going to do that but i believe that we need to come together just to maybe have a space to start conversation how we as the local regional and international can work together and be strategic about uh about our work so that we can counter the anti-gender anti group that spreads um, gender binary and try to build the structure that prevent LGBT and trans people to access to resources and services and also to, uh, to, to, uh, to develop the policy that protects and promote the rights of LGBT and transgender people. What a journey you had, really, like amazing, absolutely so inspiring. And um, uh, also the way you have contributed from grounds up, building a movement in Thailand and impacting change and to in the kind of role which you are currently uh, doing, helping, uh, you know, so many gender diverse groups around the world. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Totally um, agree, like, you know, like the, what you said about serve what people need. Amazing. I really wish that, oh, you know, this should be the heart of, of uh, all kinds of programs and uh, which, uh, which it is not. Many a times I've seen it is not. It is the other way around. So before we wrap up, uh, can, any final thoughts? There is a few things that I think I should also mention. Um, I think intersectionality is very important approach. You know, when um, for feminists, I think it's very important to look at uh, gender and intersectional intersectionality because people with different identity, sometimes their identity bring them disadvantages, sometimes it bring them privileges. And um, so, for example, uh, let me give you example of, you know, being a transgender person. Transgender is not the same, right? Not even single one person even though they identify themselves as transgender person, it's not the same because uh, uh, within the trans community, there is a trans community disability, there's trans community uh, that's young people, transgender that uh, trans masculine, transgender non-binary, or transgender who, uh, who, who belong to ethnic minority, something like that. So, you know, with this intersectionality approach, it help us understand the diverse of people, it, uh, even they come from the same uh, community, but they they may have different identity. And um, if we don't understand this, we, we will try to think of the program or services or policy that only a certain group of people being able to access based on their privileges, but then we leave out a lot of people. You know, we've been talking this beautiful word, leave no one behind, right? And in order for us to leave no one behind, we, we have to understand the intersectionality of the people. So we have been, you know, in the past many years, we have been uh, working with feminists, right, that also include transgender women because they believe that trans women is woman. Um, but also there are a feminist group that doesn't, that exclude transgender women from the movement because they don't believe that trans women is the same as women. So we have all of this that happening. That's why I say intersectionality is very important to be considered to take it seriously because if you don't want to leave everyone or to leave other people behind, 
you will have to create the projects, services, funding that reflect on people with different identity, especially those identity that bring them these advantages, for example, disability, how much that we working with these groups of people, how much of the HIV program that benefit transgender women think about transmasculine, how much of the uh, how much of the uh, LGBT funding uh, uh, LGBT funder uh, provide funding for trans and intersex and non-binary, for example, people know a little bit of non-binary people, right? <laughs> So we have to think about it. We have to think about this intersectionality. That's one thing I, I would recommend and it's very important. Another thing is we find the news allies. So, so, you know, we have allies to support LGBT community, to support trans community, but, but then we need more allies. So find the news allies. So uh, a part of my advocacy work, a part of my passion, I try to include people from the religious to, to talk about, to start dialogue about, you know, LGBT inclusion, gender equality and, sex, uh, and uh, social inclusion, for example, that's very important topics to talk about within the religious or interface uh, circle because they are very so powerful, no, no, religious is very powerful, but not many of them understand what it's like to be LGBT people. And some people just deny to understand them because their religious or that uh, their belief prevent them from open to accept or open to open for LGBT to uh, or include them into the ritual, into the practices, into that space. So I feel like New ally is very important, and we 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 have to look at the allies that have more power in this social institution. We have to shake the social institution to think about gender equality and social inclusion for LGBT people. Because if no one doing that, they will not shake. We have to shake them we have to be able to include them in the conversation, even though we don't want to listen to what they say, but it's very important to include them anyway, because I feel like if, if, if we have that space, they will learn something, even though it takes time for them to share, maybe it's not, you know, you, you will be surprised how, how, how much, uh, uh, how many like Buddhist monks that I met, um, when I met them, they say, oh, trans women cannot, order, order, can, cannot join ordination. But now, but now, after a year that I've been having conversation with them, there is a uh, trans, uh, there is the female monks, you know, Pikuni from the Bundist. They say that, oh, we accept trans feminine to be, to be in the ordination as a seminary or novice. So, 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 you know, world is changing, world is changing. You probably don't want, you know, we need space for those people to come and talk, even though they talk nonsense, but we have to be compassionate to them. We have to be compassion, show compassion to people do, who are different, but at the same time, show compassion to yourself. And that's, and one last thing, one last thing for activists out there, all activists that listen to this talk, take care of yourself. This work we commit not just for a year or two. Some people commit for the lifetime, right? We have a lot of people before us that work toward gender equality. They have been working in this field for a really long time. Some of them pass away without knowing that their work or that the seed that they plant how grow is going to be the seed that they plant, how beautiful flower they, they may not see that. They ha we have a lot of people that work before us and we honor them. 
but at the same time when you been in this field when you have been working in this field keep yourself a calm keep yourself a break when you have time take care of yourself you will have to work in this you will have to commit in this gender equality work for a really long time if you feel like you burn out take a break don't feel guilty for just taking a break don't feel guilty to say no don't feel guilty if you're not being a part of this you know initiative on gender equality don't feel guilty at all you already do what you can you already do well and you have to give yourself a, a compassion and and being able to take a break and take care of yourself and um because your wellness meaning your wellness mean the uh the corrective wellness of our community every single one of you if you're well our community will move forward it's such an inspiration for me also to to hear you uh, really like we all need to be compassionate about not only when we deal with issues with people with different opinions different you know at times uh, difficult opinions uh, uh, and uh, remain non judgmental but at the same time we need to be compassionate about ourselves our own selves so so deeply so deeply true and uh, a shame or self stigma is such a huge challenge we all deal with it as humans um, so so thanks a lot for mentioning that it has been such a amazing learning uh, you know to hear your insights and that's what we were looking for to as you rightly said that we are not here for for a small project or small few number of days it's a long haul because people like you will change the world and it is always people like you even if they are small in number they have changed the world so uh, because of the conviction because of their belief and the, they uh, and they don't take no for an answer they they change the world and make it a better place for everyone let us hope that the, the seeds which you have planted uh, they continue to uh, you know provide shade and provide fruits and provide life uh, to all around people and also your light spreads thanks a lot who are again and uh, um, and all the best for the journey ahead you have had a very long journey but there's a longer one ahead and we are part of your journey too thanks a lot working thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you